Hello, and welcome to National History Academy's live virtual tours. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Um, we are National History Academy, who uh, we are, are actively recruiting this summer for um, students rising 7th through 12th graders, and welcome students to join our online programs to study history, explore history. Um, and if you'd like to learn more, we encourage you to visit our website. Um, at National History Academy. Um, today, we are very excited to travel to Keene, California, to Cesar Chavez National Monument and speak with Miranda Hernandez, who is our Educator Park Ranger. She's going to lead us today um, on a, a labor reform uh, movement um, adventure and let us know more about Cesar Chavez, his life and legacy. Welcome, Miranda. Thank you. It's nice to meet you, everybody. Uh, like uh, Amy introduced me, I am Ranger Miranda. I'm here in Keene, California, which uh, if you've never heard of it, that's okay. I had never heard of it before. Uh, I moved here, even though I'm only, I was born and raised about two hours away in um, the LA Basin area. So we are north of Los Angeles, but um, way south of San Francisco. If you've ever heard of the Central Valley of California, that farming valley, we are just about at the bottom southern edge where the mountains start to go up again. And I will be taking you, we will be watching a short video, and then I'll be talking to you a little bit about what our monument is about, and then we will go outside together and I'll show you what it looks like. And we are going to go into our movie now. raising wages above the poverty level, establishing hiring unions, and creating grievance procedures. They also funded health care and pension plans, mandated the provision of clean drinking water and restroom facilities in the fields, regulated the use of pesticides in the fields, and established a fund for community service programs. His leadership brought international attention to the problems of U.S. farm workers. Under his direction and others such as Dolores Huerta and Larry Itleon, the farm worker movement joined forces with other reform movements to achieve successes that greatly improved the lives of farm workers. As a result, Chavez earned a higher degree of national prominence and significance during his lifetime than any other Latino in U.S. history so far. Cesar E. Chavez National Monument, known also as Nuestra Señora Reina de la Paz, Our Lady of Peace, or simply La Paz, is a 108-acre site located in the Tehachapi Pass, situated in the Tehachapi Mountains, a transverse range separating the Central Valley of California on the northwest and the Mojave Desert on the southeast. The monument is located northeast of a town called Keene and is operated by the National Park Service and the National Chavez Center. The Quonset Hutch, shown here, was built in the 1950s by the state of California during the last part of an era when the property functioned as a tuberculosis hospital. When Chavez relocated his office from Delano, California to La Paz in 1970, many buildings that existed on the site were repurposed. The Quonset Hut became the security headquarters for the United Farm Workers. Welcome to the Visitor Center. La Paz was made a national monument in 2012 by President Barack Obama. On September 8, 1965, Filipino American grape workers, members of the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, walked out on strike against Delano area table and wine grape growers, protesting years of poor pay and awful working conditions.
the Filipinos asked Cesar Chavez, who led mostly a Latino farm workers union, the National Farm Workers Association, to join their strike. Cesar and the leaders of the NFWA believed it would be years before their fledgling union was ready for a strike. But he also knew how growers historically pitted one race against another to break field walkouts. Cesar's union voted to join the Filipino workers' walkouts on Mexican Independence Day, September 16, 1965. From the beginning, this would be a different kind of strike. Cesar inspired the Latino and Filipino strikers to work together, sharing the same picket lines, kitchens, and union halls. He asked strikers to take a solemn vow to remain nonviolent. The strike drew unprecedented support from outside the Central Valley, from other unions, church activists, students, Latinos and other minorities, and civil rights groups. Cesar led a 300-mile march, or peregrinación, from Delano to Sacramento. It placed the farm workers' plight squarely before the conscience of the American people. The strikers turned to boycotts, including table grapes, which eventually spread across North America. Cesar's office remains as it was when he was active at La Paz from 1970 to 1988. The administrative building that housed the office had deteriorated to such a degree that it could not be saved. Before the building was demolished, experts from the Smithsonian Institution cataloged each object and its precise location. The walls were left in place when the building was raised. Upon completion of the new building, each object was returned to its previous spot and a window installed to allow visitors to view the office and its contents. Here you will see an arbor that marks the entrance to the Chavez Memorial Garden. Encompassing more than a thousand square feet, the Memorial Garden includes the Chavez burial site, several beds of specialized roses, a screen of Italian cypress, and rosemary lining the perimeter of the garden. Upon his death in 1993, Chavez was buried in the rose garden that had been cultivated at this location. Landscape architect Dennis Dallin designed and supervised the construction of the formal memorial space in 2001. The desert garden is planted with desert species found in Arizona, where Cesar Chavez once lived. Of the 108 acres within the boundaries of the National Monument, 1.9 are federal land, 8.6 are federal interest, and 96 are privately owned and operated by the National Chavez Center. The cross-shaped building was the financial management building for the United Farm Workers during the 1970s. The building was originally constructed as a children's hospital in the early 1920s. Building four is the largest building in the National Monument. Made in 1927 as part of California's tuberculosis sanitarium, it was the first hospital on the site. The UFW converted the building to a dormitory in the 70s and it functioned as such through the 1980s. Thousands of union members came to La Paz to help devise and implement organizing strategies, receiving training in contact administration, and to strengthen their sense of solidarity. This area was the central hub of activity during the UFW period. The cafeteria in the center of the residential area, flanked by the Chavez House and a number of other residential buildings, became a gathering place where people lived and celebrated together. The residential area is situated uphill to the north and sprawls out to encompass the wide open terrain within the oak savanna. This area is defined by the Tehachapi Creek to the southwest, and the central peak within the site gradually rises to nearly 3,000 feet. The only building constructed in the early 70s was a small metal structure used as a graphic shop. This building has been added to several times and currently serves as the union's administration building. The landscape of La Paz offered Chavez a personal refuge. 
As he told writer Jacques Levy in 1970, he needed a place to, quote, reflect on what was happening, to shed all those million little problems, and to look at things a little more dispassionately. The site's varied elevation and landscape of oak savanna and grassland provide an open character and expansive view of the surrounding mountains. In the drier months, the California blue oaks color the landscape laden with golden grass. The spring brings wildflowers and lush green grasses. The North Unit, recently renamed the Villa La Paz Conference Center, is located near the northeast corner of the property. During the UFW era, it played an important role in the community's everyday life. The building was the center of celebrations, education, and business. The building fell into disuse during the 1990s. A restoration project completed in 2010 now allows the building to be used as a full service conference and retreat center. The Villa La Paz area is a key view within the National Monument. The area offers panoramic views of the three peaks and is situated among scattered oak trees on gently sloping terrain. The Peace Rocks were established as a memorial by Chavez to honor the memory of the first three martyrs of the movement. Members of the Chavez family, who still live in La Paz, recall Cesar rising early and climbing the nearby mountainside for a daily ritual of morning meditation around this spot. We hope you have enjoyed this tour. This new national park is a work in progress. More exhibits are under development, and in coming years, much more will come to this important site of American history. The breadth of the Latinx experience is a vital aspect of the U.S.'s rich and diverse past. The places explored here barely begin to hint at the ways this story intersects with other experiences, and we hope you are inspired to learn more. Cesar E. Chavez is recognized as the Okay, I love that video. It actually does such a good job. I wish that lady that was narrating it could come and work here with me. But uh, we are going to get into um, some of the things that she kind of touched upon in the video, but also some things that um, we didn't have time to in that video and some things that have come to light since it was recorded. So luckily we are now a park service site as of 2012. Um, that means it is protected and preserved and people like me are here to teach people like you about it. Um, we preserve places that are historical, cultural, natural, um, geological, all these different things, but this one is primarily historical and cultural, even though we have some of those other good things as well. This here is a picture of Caesar. You probably saw a couple in the tour that we just went through, and we are going to get going with our overview because I always like to know what I'm getting into before I do it. So uh, we're gonna talk about why Caesar fought for change, what led him to dedicate his life to his cause, which we'll learn a little bit about, who did he learn from, um, who inspired him, how did he fight? A lot of times I give these presentations and I definitely learned my lesson early to clarify what I meant by fight. Um, was it with his fist or was it with his words or his brain? So we'll talk a little bit about that. And who did he inspire? Who came after him? And we, then we are going to go outside quickly and take that quick tour of the outdoors. So why did Caesar fight for change and what was he trying to change? Let's start from the beginning. Uh, he was born in the 1920s in southern Arizona, very southern, almost Mexico. And things were pretty good there. His family had a farm, uh, he had a nice childhood, but when he was about 10, they lost their farm. Plus the Great Depression was happening around then too in 1929. That means jobs, jobs were really hard to come by. So unfortunately, his family lost their house. They had to pick up all their stuff and move to find jobs. Now, there were some jobs in California, in the Central Valley of California, kind of by where we are now, but they weren't very good jobs because they didn't last very long. They were these farm worker agricultural jobs. Sometimes they only lasted two or three days. If they were lucky, they could stay somewhere for two or three weeks at a time. 
And some people like to be on the road traveling. Um, some people wait their whole lives to retire and travel around the country. But if you don't have a choice, you don't have a home and you don't have money or access to healthcare or even bathroom sometimes, it can be a pretty terrible way to live. So Caesar and his family were full-time uh, seasonal or migrant farm workers. A migrant is just that moving all around. And you'll notice that this person right here is pretty young to be picking fruit. And that's because the kids work too. There were no child labor laws that were applied to the places that Caesar was. So he started working right away as well. He actually quit school pretty early because he noticed that his parents were getting more and more run down and there wasn't enough money to put food on the table. So, and after moving uh, almost 30 times before eighth grade, you can imagine that it was really hard to keep up with all these different teachers and all these different schools. So he dropped out of school in eighth grade. That didn't mean that he didn't love reading and love learning. It just meant that he couldn't keep up with the school at the time. So why exactly did he fight? We talked a little bit about it being really hard moving all the time, but when they were actually at these jobs, what was it like? They were paid very low. They often didn't even have water in the field, even though they were expected to be there for all day before the sun rose till the sun set, sometimes after. There were no bathrooms in a lot of the fields. And remember, they're picking food, right? So you would think that the growers or the bosses would have bathrooms, but there weren't. And it was also pretty undignified to have to use the restroom in front of everyone. And they had no right to choose a union. Um, if you don't know what a union is, it's kind of a, a group of people. Usually they work at the same profession or the same job and they kind of get together in this group and they're on the same team and they say, we want a certain type of rights. We want the right to maybe water, we want the right to bathrooms, or we're not going to work anymore because we're a solid team. And they also wanted better farm worker housing. You'll see an example of kind of all these shanties put together here. And most of the time they were one room shacks. And to be honest, they were lucky if they even got a roof over their head uh, because sometimes Caesar and his family had to spend uh, days in the car or um, underneath a tree when it was raining. So uh, if they had a light bulb that worked, uh, they were pretty lucky. A lot of this work back then in the 1930s, 40s, 50s was with the short handled hoe. Now, some people still use this tool in their garden today. They're just sitting down or kneeling down, kind of doing it leisurely. But these people here had to use it all day, every day for years on end, including Caesar. And they got really bad back problems after doing this for so long. And the whole point of it is to turn up the soil, right? So they can do the same thing with a tool with a longer stick, but the growers wanted the workers to be very careful. They wanted to be kind of controlling so they wouldn't mess anything up. So if you can, if you don't already have a bad back, just be very careful. Go ahead and stand up where you are and you are going to pretend that you have your tool in your hand and it can be shiny, it can be dirty, whatever you'd like and take it in your hand and we are going to make like this farm worker here. We're going to raise it above our head and go all the way to the floor. I don't want you to hurt your back. I just want you to see how uncomfortable it is. So take it and go. Ugh. Okay, that was kind of uncomfortable and I only did it three times. Just imagine yourself doing that for 10 hours in the hot sun with no water around. That sounds like a terrible job to have, right? And to be making almost no money doing it, that was really terrible. So Caesar decided he wanted to help the people around him. Um, remember he was American, a Mexican American, but um, he wanted to help all the farm workers around him. So who inspired him? Who did he learn from? He learned from someone who was doing things at the same time as him, Martin Luther King Jr. Now Martin Luther King Jr. wanted to do things peacefully. 
and they were kind of um, they were kind of doing civil rights at the same time. Martin Luther King was, of course, in the South for African American people, and Cesar Chavez was over here in California doing things for farm workers. A lot of them were Mexican American farm workers, but not all of them were. There were all different types of farm workers. There were um, African American or Black people. There were Puerto Rican, Filipino, um, white people. There were all types of all um, all ethnicities of people. But there was a movement that kind of started from Cesar Chavez that was inspired by him, and it was called the Chicano movement. And that was kind of like a Mexican pride movement. And it wasn't to say that Mexicans were better than anyone else. It was to say that we are no longer going to be ashamed of being Mexican or Mexican American, because before they were kind of um, they were kind of put down a lot. And as we know in our society today, there's a kind of it's a hot political topic. All these different um, kind of racial theories as well. And who else did Caesar learn from? He learned from Gandhi. So one of the biggest things about Caesar was that he was nonviolent. So we talked a little bit about how he fought and he fought in a nonviolent way. He was quoted once to say that if something had to be done in a violent way, it wasn't worth doing at all. And one of the people that he learned this from was his mom. His mom was a devout Catholic and she kind of went by that, uh, that lesson from the Bible that said, turn the other cheek. In fact, sometimes when Caesar or his siblings got beat up in school, she said, just pray for them uh, and don't fight back, which is a really intense uh, viewpoint for a mother to take towards her children. But he took that on for the rest of his life. And because he had such a strong view of that, it led him to fast a little bit later. You fast, you don't eat, right? And that's a nonviolent way to protest or to make your voice heard. Um, and he did that because the people in his movement or in La Causa, which is the farm workers struggle or cause, they were starting to want to fight back with their fists. They were getting tired of being trampled on. Um, people had been killed and they said, why are we just sitting back and letting our people be hurt? We need to stand up and fight, like actually fight. And he said, oh my goodness. I must have failed you as a leader because if we're going to do anything, it has to be nonviolent. So he undertook a fast for almost a whole month and he did three of those really long fasts in his whole life. And some people think, some doctors think that they that may have contributed to his early death. But I want to go back to this guy right here, Larry Itliang. Um, he is a Filipino gentleman. And back then in 1965, he was the leader of this organization called Agricultural Workers Organizing Union or Organizing Committee, excuse me. It's kind of a mouthful. You can just call it AWOC. But the point is, he was very similar to Caesar. He wanted to help the people around him that were farm workers. And he decided that they weren't going to take it anymore. He was a little more militant than Caesar was. And he organized this walkout in the great fields um, in this area. And he came to Caesar and his union and he said, will you join us? We need you because they're just gonna try to put our races against each other. We need your support. We're going for the same thing, better treatment. And then Caesar came back to the union and they took a vote and it was pretty contentious. contentious. They said, why should we help them? They always break our strikes. We're not ready yet. We weren't planning on doing this. But after they talked about it for a couple hours, they said, we need to help them. We need to step up. It was actually Helen Chavez, who was Caesar's wife, who stood up in front of everyone and said, look, are we going to be a union or not? And, um, and she often was the person that was next to Caesar's side. And her name isn't up there with all the banners everywhere, but she was just as much for this cause as he was. And she was his support. I spoke with his uh, three of his children recently, and they wanted to make sure that it was known that Helen Chavez wasn't the strong woman behind the man, but she was right next to him. So how did he fight? 
I mentioned nonviolent, right? So what did he do? He did the fast that we talked about. Um, he almost died from some of them. The doctors were begging him to please stop the fast um, because his body was starting to shut down and they picketed so and they boycotted. So right here, boycott Safeway. They would boycott lettuce, grapes. The grape boycott went on for five years, 1965 to 1970 is when they earned their first uh, union contracts. And this here is from the march to Sacramento. They also call it the pilgrimage to Sacramento because Caesar was Catholic. So a lot of his mindset was paying penance um, for things. And for instance, he wanted to pay penance to kind of for any nonviolence that had been or any violence that had been in the movement so far. So they set out, it took 25 days to go from Delano, California, which is about in mid California, all the way up to Sacramento. They walked all day and they slept in different uh, small towns through the night. Sometimes they had to sleep outside, but it was kind of a group effort. There was a lot of organizing of people calling ahead, going ahead to make sure there were places to sleep, things to eat, things like that. And when they crossed the bridge into Sacramento, they were marching to the Capitol. Uh, there were about 10,000 people waiting for them in support. So even if everyone wasn't walking the whole time with them, if they just popped in for a little, or if they were there at the end, there was a lot of support for this, for this cause. And this was around, um, there wasn't social media and there wasn't the internet back then, but there was television and there were newspapers. So people started to know what was going on and that's specifically why Caesar did something so dramatic as this, walking for 25 days straight in this giant group. It was for visibility to make his cause known. And he ended it on Easter Sunday to be extra dramatic. They all did that on purpose. And I keep saying dramatic, but it's not a bad thing. It was, it was righteous. It was, trying to make things, it was trying to make things better for the people around them that they loved. Now, what leaders were inspired by La Causa? So you all know who this is, President Barack o or former President Barack Obama. Um, and I like to include him in here because if you were, if you remember during his uh, kind of run up his election campaign, his, his phrase was, uh, yes, we can. And a lot of times with La Causa, the phrase that goes along with that is si se puede. And if you don't speak Spanish or know what that means, it just means, yes, it can be done. So yes, we can, yes, it can be done. They're very similar, right? But Caesar, or Caesar, um, Mr. Obama, President Obama had told this lady, Dolores Huerta, when he met her, he said, hey, I kind of borrowed your catchphrase. And she said, yeah, I know, but that's okay. And he said it to her because, to let me introduce Dolores Huerta. She was a co-founder, um, very close of the UFW, very close to this whole kind of cause. And she was very short, but she was a firecracker. She was an activist. She still is an activist. She's almost 90, but uh, she still fights for farm workers' rights, but she's transitioned a little more into women's rights, um, environmentalism, a lot of, a whole range of things. And she actually still lives locally in California. And when she was fighting for rights, for farm workers' rights in Arizona, they had told her, look, you can do that crazy stuff in California, but you can't get away with that stuff here. And she said, si se puede, yes, it can, or yes, we can, it can be done. So that became the catchphrase. And you might hear people chanting si se puede, and it's kind of an inspirational thing uh, we have it on all of our stuff here, and I like to say it to myself when I feel like I can't get something done. I think, si se puede. So you can say it to yourself, too. And this woman here, Teresa Romero, um, she used to work about a five-minute walk from here. And I am in the building in the visitor center, by the way, that used to be the administration offices for Caesar and his group. And Teresa used to work pretty close, but now she's been appointed to the Biden transition team. 
So she was here. She was. Uh, she started as a secretary, I believe. Then she moved up to the president. And now she's on the Biden transition team. And I think that's really cool. She started from the ground up and was working for things that she cared about. And you'll see these little Aztec eagles all over the place. And it looks kind of intense, but they are on the United Farm Workers flag. And a lot of people, when they rolled that puppy out, they said, mm, looks kind of scary, looks looks threatening. I don't know if we want to do that. People are going to think we're up to no good. And then Caesar said, it, I, we know what it represents. It represents strength and it represents kind of um, tenacity that we are going to keep going until we get what we need, what we want. But not at all costs, we are going to stay nonviolent. So that's what that kind of means if you see this around when you see the United Farm Workers around as well. So that's all we have for the inside section. I want to just mention, because a lot of people like this stuff, we have a Junior Ranger book. If you want to go online, you can always get that from our website. You can just uh, Google or type in your favorite search engine, um, Caesar, Caesar E. Chavez National Monument, Junior Ranger. And then you can download this, send it in, and then you can get your Junior Ranger badges. And they have these at lots of national park sites and they're free. So if you want to do that, that would be great. So now is the part where I am going to transition to outside and take you out there. Um, I have a quick surprise guest. And for anyone that has uh, seen a preview of this tour before, that surprise guest wasn't on there last time. So should be good. So just give me one second and I will be back to you on another camera. We open the front door. And will my host please allow me to share my video on the second front, please? Awesome. Okay, cool. So, my special surprise guest. Her name is, well, you can introduce yourself if you like. Hi, my name is Bernadette Farinas. Um, I'm a Chavez. I'm one of Caesar and Helen's granddaughters. And I run the store. And she makes things fun here every day. And the cool thing about working with Bernadette is that she tells me stories just about every day about her, she calls them her- Nana and Tata. Yeah, she calls them her Nana and Tata. That's what she called them. Um, so it's a really personal connection and a lot of the family still works around here. So it's an interesting kind of Caesar and Helen aren't still with us. A lot of their family is, so it's kind of a, a living site and I really like to be part of that. So I'm gonna turn you around and we are walking up to the Memorial Garden that you saw in the previous tour and these kind of big girthy wooden pieces, I just thought maybe they just brought them because they look nice, they match the architecture. But I was talking to Paul Chavez, Caesar's son, and he says that those were there because Caesar liked to be of the earth. They were strong, they were going to stand there. They're actually repurposed. They're not brand new, they're not polished. Um, and Caesar was kind of a nature lover. Uh, if he wasn't a civil rights activist, maybe he would have been a park ranger or a gardener or something uh, because he loved to be out here. That's part of the reason why he moved to La Paz. 
because he found rejuvenation and joy and peace up here. And when he had the weight of the world on his shoulders and he was trying to solve those problems, um, he needed a place to be able to take a breath and rethink about all of it. So over here, we have our grave site of Helen and Caesar. This is Helen over here. This is Caesar. And somewhere in this grass, their dogs are buried as well. Their dogs were Boycott and Huelga. They were German shepherds, if you've ever seen them in pictures. And Caesar asked to be buried with his dogs whenever it was that he died. He died pretty unexpectedly in 1993. And Helen decided to honor his wishes. It wasn't a beautiful garden back then. It was kind of, um, it was kind of noisy. There were cars passing by on either side. It wasn't very peaceful with this nice little waterfall here. But um, Helen liked to make the joke that Caesar wanted to see who was coming late to work and who was leaving early from work because their offices are out there. Because Caesar was known for being kind of a workaholic. He would stay late, come very early, sometimes before the sun would even rise. Um, so it's just a little joke they had, but he really wanted to be close to his dogs, close to where his, his life's work, work was really. I mean, his house is only about a five minute walk over there. And then Helen, of course, she always expressed that she wanted to be buried next to Caesar, but she was so worried that he would be left alone if anything ever happened. And she wanted, um, she, one of her concerns was that she wanted to be with him. So now they are laying together and they will always be together. Now, I wanna point out this fountain here. It's not arbitrary that it has five streams going into the pool. There were five martyrs that were killed as part of the movement. Um, they were of three different religions. So it wasn't all your kind of traditional Mexican-American Catholic farm workers. I think it was, uh, it just shows how many more people cared about that, that they realized that this was kind of a human rights issue. It wasn't just uh, people wanting things for themselves, being selfish. It was um, everybody realizing that these people deserve that dignity. Um, the different religions were Judaism, um, Islam, and of course, Catholicism or Christianity. And we are going to take a little walk down this rose right here, this deep red rose, kind of reminds me of Alice in Wonderland sometimes. It's called the Cesar Chavez Rose, a nursery that they were negotiating contracts with. Part of the contract was to create a rose specifically in memory of Cesar Chavez, and that's what they came up with. And it's beautiful. The, there are plenty of red roses in the world, but that one is especially a deep red. So as you leave the very peaceful Memorial Garden, you go into our Garden of the Southwest. And we mentioned briefly that Caesar was born in Arizona, right? Very Southern Arizona. So these plants here, all these prickly pear and aloe vera, they don't occur naturally in this part of the mountains. We are in a very dry area, but this isn't their home base. So we planted it to try to make it look a little more like the Sonoran Desert in which Caesar would have grown up. And you'll see we are in the mountains. Even though about a 30 minute drive down the freeway, you'll be in those usually pretty hot fields that Caesar and all of those farm workers worked in and they still work in today. So we are going to take a little walk down to see Caesar and Helen's house. And I'll just orient you of where we are. Down there was an accounting building. And down there, you can see it peeking through. It's not owned by the Park Service, but it was a tuberculosis sanitarium. And before this place was purchased by Caesar Chavez and the UFW in 1970, this place was kind of where they sent people that had tuberculosis. And what's really strange is that Helen Chavez, when she was a little girl, 
um, she lived in the Central Valley in Delano. There were some healthcare workers, some maybe social workers that came to check on her. And she, she was very, um, she was kind of poor. They didn't, maybe didn't have enough to eat. And they decided that she was suffering from malnourishment. So they sent her all the way out here to Keene, which is hours away today by car. And this was in the 1930s. And today with our freeways, it's maybe two hours away. And remember I mentioned they hardly had enough money to eat. So they didn't have enough money to have a car that would make it that far to put gas in the car. So sadly, when she was maybe 10 years old, she was sent out here and she lived out here for months and months. Maybe uh, one of the sons said it was 17 months. And she was so lonely and she hated her time out here. And when Caesar suggested that, oh, he found somewhere in the mountains, it's going to be so nice, we're going to move out here, she said, oh, where is it? And he said, oh, it's in Keene. It's a really big property. And it used to be a tuberculosis place. She said, oh, no, I do not want to go. No way, Jose. <sighs> so at first, she didn't move out here. But then she realized when things started to get more serious and Sometimes there were even threats on Caesar's life that she wanted to be there for him. Um, and it was more serious than just what she wanted. It was for the bigger cause. And so once again, she was by his side and they lived in this house here. It looks a little bit different than it did when they were living here. It needs a little bit of a paint job, but we uh, will give it its historic due. Um, we just obtained it a few years ago when Helen passed, unfortunately. And um, so we're doing the cataloging of the things in there and getting it nice and tidy to run tours, hopefully sooner ra rather than later. Um, so if there are any questions while I am walking to Helen, what we call Helen's Park, I can take them now because it's just around this corner. And if not, we can just join the walk. No, we do have questions, Ms. Miranda. So thank you so much. Thank you for the awesome tour. Um, we have several questions. Um, one that came in was, um, when you were talking about his fast, what did he gain during his fast? Good, so the, the fasts were all for different reasons. So the first one was to re-inspire his, uh, his fellow union, uh, I want to say supporters, to recommit to nonviolence, to remember why they were there and the way in which they were going to do it. And they realigned. And let's remember that he was a leader. So he had a vision. He wanted things done a certain way, and that way was nonviolently. And they recommitted to it. So thankfully, his way was nonviolent because he was a very persistent, stubborn person because he was going to stay there his whole life to get um, what he believed in. And that's what he did, even though he died in early life, an early death, unfortunately. Um, he died doing what was important to him, which was fighting for other people's dignity and rights. So um, from the other fast, I know his last fast, towards the end of his life, he started getting very much more aware of the effects of pesticides and that was like his last last big push that he was trying to gain awareness for um, this movement kind of got famous and he would travel all around to these farming towns and he started to notice that the farming towns that use a lot of pesticides a lot of birth defects were happening i mean there were things like low birth weight and, um, and chest and lung problems, but also some kids were being born without limbs and like really major things. So that last fast was to raise awareness for um, against the use of pesticides in the field, at least specific ones that were shown to cause um, health concerns. Yeah. 
it's a great lead in, Miss Miranda, into our next um, question. It's, it's kind of, uh, I'll let you take it in any direction here. But um, so what improvements in labor conditions today do you think Chavez would be most happy to see? And then flipping that, um, what labor conditions today would be the most disappointing to him that haven't been resolved? Or like, what are those issues today that um, are still a part of the farm labor re um, movement? I think the, the thing that he would be most kind of proud of would be the right to organize. And even though sometimes people are still exposed to the more powerful company or the more powerful boss kind of maybe strong arming them or intimidating them, that's always going to be there in human nature. But I think that it's more federally recognized uh, and widely recognized for farm workers to have unions. And I think that he would be encouraged by that. But I do get this question a lot from um, certain kids that are thinking about it, like, how can we continue Caesar's work today? Like, what would he be working on if he were alive? And well, first he would be tackling those pesticides because people are practically swimming in poison out there, right? I mean, we put that poison on there to kill all those little bugs, but if they are going through there with the water dripping on them, it's not good for them to breathe either. But I think honestly, something that I've kind of seen as well is just because people have the ability to organize doesn't mean that they always want to speak up because a lot of people um, don't have legal status as American citizens or even American visas. So they might not want to draw attention to themselves. So if they're undergoing abuse at work or sexual harassment at work, any of those things, they might be kind of threatened to say, you're lucky you have a job, you know, uh, you'll be fired if you say anything. So I think that that's something that he might work on. Um, maybe, maybe to have a little bit more rights for people without that legal status or maybe uh, sexual harassment in the, in the workplace, but out in the fields. But then again, I've never met Caesar. So but that's what I think. And Bernadette was kind of nodding, so. Well, um, thank you for that. And yeah. so, so uh, how would you address, so like Chavez is known to have taken some anti-immigration positions. And then right. how did those positions intersect with his labor form ideologies? Could you speak a little bit about? Yeah, I'd love to, because that's a question that, you know, one person comments on Facebook and then it turns into, it can turn into like a, a whirlwind of emotions, let's say. But so what he, he wasn't an anti-immigration person. What he didn't support was people coming to break the strikes because his whole thing was we are going on strike to make it harder for the grower and we want them to not be able to work without us right and if anyone including um braceros or illegal immigrants were to come in and break that strike he was pissed he was mad he he, he was very upset and a lot of times unfortunately those were the people that would come up um, but there were also the Teamsters too during that time and there was a lot of tension between them and the Teamsters. Um, but yeah, I, as far as I've seen and as far as I've talked to the family and, and all these people, he didn't have a problem with people that were from other countries at all. He was a very accepting person. In fact, they would have religious services of um, all different types here, not just Catholicism. and. So it wasn't an anti-immigration standpoint. It was the fact that if that influx of labor kind of flooded the market to the point where they couldn't get more uh, higher wages or more fair working conditions, then he was against that part of it. Appreciate the clarification. So thank you so much. Um, yeah. And 
I guess, and I don't know if um, Bernadette's still there as well, but what are some of the stories that his family share about him and the sacrifices that his family had to make? Two very different questions, but family family related. So I'm gonna start it off, um, even though you directly addressed Bernadette, because I promised her I wouldn't make her talk too much. But um, so I'm going to relay the stories that um, the brothers told me, Paul and Anthony and then she can add anything that she wants to at the end. So um, Anthony said that it was, so we interviewed them in the Chavez residence that we just passed. And he said it was really hard. I, I asked him what the vibe was when, a very technical term, when Caesar was home, right? And I said, was it fun? Was it happy? Was it stressed? And he said, honestly, he wasn't home that much. Um, he was usually on the road. But when he was home, he made the best of any time that he had with us. And he started to tear up because Caesar was pretty much a joy to be around. Like he was known as this, as this kind of playful man, which is funny because he tackled so many serious things. But I guess that's how he kept going with it. So he would always be messing with Helen. Helen was kind of the more serious one, um, but he, they had to sacrifice a lot, but they were brought up in it. So Bernadette's mom, Eloise, was mentioning that even as kids, they knew that they had to wake up on Saturday mornings and go distribute the pamphlets and go canvassing. It was just something that they had to do. And the farm workers weren't removed from the Chavez family, right? Like they were the ones that came here, worked here, they went down to them, to the farm workers, and so they saw what they were working for. So even though it was a huge sacrifice because this was their whole life and they didn't choose it and their, their dad was always on the move, um, they saw what they were working for. So um, Bernadette, do you have anything to add on the question of how was it for the family with your Tata moving a lot? Or working a lot? No, I think you. I think that's exactly what it was. It was. Uh, it was difficult because he wasn't around. But um, when he was, he made. He was fun. As grandkids, we enjoyed it. He was very playful. Sweet. And they were mentioning these stories about um, was it softball or baseball games? Oh yeah. They have like an overgrown baseball diamond around here, and he would pitch for both teams, and he would. <laughs> He, there's just there was no rhyme or reason to like when somebody would be called out he would be like oh that's three strikes you get out of here that was a strike he didn't like so to lose. <laughs> so he didn't like to lose but it was all in good nature good fun but I could just imagine being hit and being so frustrated at that but he had eight kids I haven't mentioned so he sure has a lot of grandkids too um and they would be on the floor of that house that we just passed and he would lay on the floor and they would all be tugging on him and jumping on him. And, and then he would say um, to your Nana, they would, he would say, can you come down here with us? And then she would be like, no. no. And he would be like, you're a mean Nana. <laughs> so the, he, it was just this cute dynamic, to be honest. But um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you so much. I think so many of us could relate to just hearing those stories. And thank yeah. you, Miss um, Bernadette. We didn't mean to put you on the spot. So thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, um, so I know our time's almost ra wrapping up. So maybe just one last final question. Um, okay. So how can we carry on Chavez's legacies? What can we do today in 2021? Maybe some of us are joining from the East Coast, mm -hmm. you know, not in California. Um, what can we do or be aware of ourselves to maybe think about farm labor reform or issues that Chavez would have been um, mm -hmm. particularly um, attentive to? Yeah, so I think that's kind of a two-pronged answer. Um, I think that First of all, like to carry on Caesar's legacy in in a larger respect, it's protect your protect protect your fellow human because all of this was to help other people, and he helped people 
that weren't farm workers. He helped everybody he could around him. So if you can find a way to help your brother or sister or neighbor or whoever you want to, whatever way you want to do it, then that's carrying on his legacy in whatever way you can. It doesn't have to be picketing or boycotting or something like that. But I think just in, in and the other side of that is to think about where your food comes from, <laughs> because fruit and vegetables, sometimes they have this um, association or connotation of like privilege, right? You're, you're lucky if you can afford these smoothies or fresh vegetables or things like that. But these people that pick them, a lot of times they don't have permanent homes. A lot of times they don't have enough food, even though they're picking food. So I think just realizing the human cost of where this is coming from, um, they're not just like happy little strawberries all the time that like end up on your, in your lunch pail, although they can be, but you want to think about those people out there that planted them and fertilized them and were exposed to the pesticides and picked them in the hot, hot sun. Um, and yeah, and, and think about if you think what kind of wage you think those people deserve, because it's easy to say, oh, these strawberries are so expensive or this lettuce is too much or things like that. But it's like, how much, how much, how much work went into that? How many hours went into that? So, um, so yeah, I think that's something we can all do a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Miranda, thank you so much. On behalf of the National History Academy and all of our viewers, we really appreciate it. Seeing the grounds and having your expertise is really wonderful to be a part of. Thank you so much for having me. And we're gonna say bye to Bernadette too. Bye Bernadette. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, she has them back there too. <laughs> okay, thank you all. I'm going to so hang up now. Bye. And thank you to all of our viewers and please be sure to join us again next week at 4 p.m. for our next, our next visit in our virtual tour series.